মাইন্ড আসেল যদি তা তোর ডাক শুনে কেউ না আসে তবে একলা চলবে but uh, i thank you all for coming at a short notice i know it's a busy day as a semester time examination time um, uh, i'm so delighted to have uh, two wonderful personalities first of all shri chandra bose ji thank you very much for coming um, nothing uh, that i say would uh, complete anything uh, near to what he is um everybody knows he is related to uh, the person whose name simply makes our uh, hair stand on end um shri chandra bose uh, is uh, grand nephew of shri subhashan bose neta ji subhashan bose i will introduce uh, neta ji only through one anecdote and uh, because uh, that may not be that academic but it is so emotionally charged I remember at the age of 8 or 9 we heard the story in my little village in Uttar Pradesh which doesn't exist on the map somewhere in Baramanki district um we used to hear the baba uh some 60 kilometers away from my village in Faizabad and I was very curious uh, within a couple of years my sister got married uh, to that district very close to that place where uh, he was believed to this baba was believed to be you know we in the villages knew somehow that it was no one but the great man neta ji um and as we will take our cattle to the grazing ground we narrate the stories of what he was that's why i said how emotionally charged you become when you mention or remember the name of that person it may be a legend it may be a fable it may be a story and as i said my sister got married in first time i got a chance at the age of 11 to go to faizabad and i asked my brother will you take me to that place and what he told me that i can take you to that place but uh, you won't be able to get inside and i remember just you know driving on his scooter around that place and that memory remains in my mind today such was this figure the rest of course is written so much and of course we are planning to and we're looking forward to uh, hearing uh, chandra bose ji uh, narrate the life the relevance of uh, neta ji uh, today in 21st century and i think such uh, uh, people are not always born repeatedly in anywhere in the world and certainly not in india so that is my little introduction about this great man Uh, the other person that I we have on stage is is another uh, uh, you know person whom I have been reading for thirty years, Dr. Shapan Das Gupta. Let me announce also that he has uh, now joined uh, uh, the Centre for Media Studies as honorary visiting professor. I am very grateful to that. And uh, so he uh, uh, nothing again that I would say would uh, somehow. encompass what he is he is an academic to begin with he has studied uh, from uh, kolkata to st stephen's college to uh, london university and when i heard uh, of him and when eventually uh, saw him he would recognize that was in oxford when he was uh, a faculty in the nafeel college of oxford and then when he returned to india he took up uh, journalism and since then we have been reading him Uh, he is a, a true polymath if i may be allowed to call that writes on politics culture uh, social issues economics even um, and now of course he is in the thick of politics as a nominated uh, member of parliament in the rajya sabha so thank you for the for coming today uh, i will uh, only say that i am so grateful that both of you have uh, come today to the center for media studies and thank you all again for coming i now request uh, uh, dr shapan das gupta to introduce the speaker today excellent thank you very much uh, professor hiraman tiwari for those very kind words you know it gives great pleasure to introduce both the subject and the speaker and let me concentrate on the subject first and i think the speaker will speak for 
himself, so that could be. Yesterday, I had the uh, good fortune of talking at a seminar, not really a seminar, more of a quiz, on the 52nd death anniversary of Savar. Now, I mention this because it's important to recognize the entire galaxy of people who contributed to the making of India as we see it today. It's not the contribution of one person. It's not the contribution of one school of thought. It's the contribution of various elements which have put together. And how they've been distilled over the years into contemporary life. Suvash Chandra Bose was a very, very important personality in the freedom struggle for two different reasons. One, he had a deeply ambiguous relationship with Mahatma Gandhi. And I say deeply ambiguous for, a, for two reasons. One, he acknowledged the mass following the emotional hold of Mahatma Gandhi on the people of India. But then, he was completely at variance with the Mahatma on a number of things. There is a very slim book which an associate of his, Dilip Kumar Roy, who later became a big follower of Sri Aurobindo, and he used to say, Suvash used to tell him that his criticism is that the Mahatma transformed a medieval absurdity into a modern panacea. And he was talking mainly about the Chakha. So there was that element. And then on the question of non-violence. Now here again, we look at it in different ways. For Gandhiji, non-violence was an article of faith. It was. He had a profound commitment to it. And, it, and we can look at the intellectual origins of where it came from. But to a large number of others, non-violence was a tactic, or at best a strategy. It could be used, but it needn't be. There was no dogmatic attachment to non-violence. It was a question sometimes of political experience. And I think the same thing approach was there in Subhash Chandra Bose on the question of what, how do you fight your enemy? Your enemy's enemy is my friend. And the question of his <coughs> association with Germany, with Japan, have become issues later. But Subhash Chandra Bose wasn't the only person who associated with these people. There were a large number of other freedom fighters in Southeast Asia who did that. So Sukarno was one of them, Hong Sun was one of them. So Bartolomeu was fixed into that galaxy, so locate him in that. Now the question really arises, and I think what we'd be interested in, is these various strands of Subhartanabhu's life. And I'm not including the strand about the mystery behind what happened to him post-August 1945. Now that's a separate and a whodunit, which <laughs> excites the imagination of a lot of people, but I think that's a separate issue altogether. But I think, how do all these strands fit into contemporary discourse? Does he have a relevance, or should we just keep him as a photograph and just put the garland on him on 23rd January? That's one way of looking at it. So, use him conveniently whenever there is time. And which Subhaj Bose are we to look at? In Calcutta, there are often two portraits of Subhash Bose. There is one, the portrait of Subhash Bose dressed as a Congress leader in Dhoti, in Khadi. And there is another portrait of Subhash Bose, which is, he's in military uniform. And mind you, he was, he got into, he had a certain fascination for this, the military dimension, because even at the Congress session of 1925, 28, 28 28, the capital session of the Congress, he formed an entire military guard. And Gandhi mocked him and said, he's a Bertram Mill service. So, 
there is there are two aspects of subhashos how do they fit in to today's life and i think the important thing is not to look at it in terms of a complete adulation but to look at him critically but to look at him as a person whose patriotism whose commitment to india was never in doubt and was as much as in india so i hope some of these issues will come to the fore in chandra bose's thing he's been working quite a lot on the, on the legacy of nihilism i understand he's been set up a the uh, there's a book which he's been uh, which they've written on the unpublished letters of sort of bose and some of the others <coughs> so best is to let chandra bose very erudite speaker speak about this thing thank you very much thank you professor hiram tiwari ji dr shrapun das gupta member of parliament someone who i knew for years of course i lost touch in between but during my student days in england we used to recite in the same hostel the indian wine scene of course it's way back you're talking in the 1979 80 so it's really a pleasure to share the dais with dr shopun das gupta i was expecting a much bigger crowd but i think we have got a quality crowd in this august gathering here i had met your vice chancellor at a function about a couple of months back i was a bit surprised that he requested me to come and give a talk on subhash chandra bose at jawaharlal nehru university i think it is an honor that i have been invited to say a few words not only on subhash chandra bose the liberator of india but also about the relevance of subhash bose in 21st century india i would like to put certain historical facts in the right perspective you see netaji subhash chandra bose was the first head of state the first prime minister and minister of war of united free india we are all aware of this but it is not documented in the textbooks of history i think the time has come that we rectify the certain deletions or certain historical facts which have been obliterated may be deliberate may be not in 2018 72 years have passed but we have not been able to document and present the correct history of india's freedom struggle to the youth of india i would quickly go through I will not go into details but I will quickly go through Subhash Bose's early life as you are all aware that on 23rd January 1897 Subhash Chandra Bose was born at Katak in Odisha people 
people of Odisha claim that Shubhas Bose belongs to Odisha. People of Bengal claim that his political life, his activity to fight for India's freedom was concentrated in Bengal. So he is a Bengali. People from Punjab and Haryana, they claim that Shubhash Bose is ours because a lot of our ancestors joined the Indian National Army under the leadership of Shubhash Chandra Bose. Now going down to South India, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, they claim that Shubhash Bose was ours because we were all part of the movement in the Indian National Army. But I would like to state that Shubhash Chandra Bose was neither Muria, neither from Bengal, nor from Haryana, Punjab, Tamil Nadu or Kerala. Shubhash Chandra Bose was a Bharatiya. He was a Bharatiya first and Bharatiya last. I think the relevance of Shubhash Chandra Bose in the Azad Hind Forge, he could establish people as Bharatiyas. Who were the people in the Azad Hind Forge? You know, in the Azad Hind Forge, there were no Muslims. There were no Sikhs. There were no Hindus. There were no Christians. Then who were the people who fought for India's freedom in the Azad Hind Forge? They were only Bharatiyas. So the youth of India must realize, in order to keep our national integration, in order to keep Bharat, India united, we have to follow the ideology and principles of the first head of state, Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose. His schooling, as you know, early schooling was in Katak. He was at the Protestant European School and then Ravenshaw Collegiate School. During this period of his early education, Subhash Chandra Bose was inspired by none other than Swami Vivekananda. It was Swamiji's principles and ideology of character building of making character among mankind, which inspired Netaji and Shubhash Chandra Bose implemented this ideology in his Azad in Forge. If you see the heroic battle of the Azad in Forge in the Infal border in Nagaland, you would see the character that he could build within the army of Azad Hind Forge and Indian National Army. It was Swamiji's principles which was amplified in the character of each and every soldier of the Azad Hind Forge. He was quite a brilliant student. He passed the matriculation examination ranking, ranking second at the university. encouraged 
by my great grandfather Janakinath Bose, who was a government leader at the Qatar High Court, that Subhash must sit for the ICS examination. Now, the Indian Civil Service examination, as you are aware, was an extremely tough examination to crack. Today, you have the Indian Administrative Service, which is also a, a difficult exam, but not so difficult as the earlier ICS. You know, Subhash only got eight months to study for the ICS. It is a full-time two-year course, but he did not have the time. He sat for the ICS examination after studying for eight months, and he stood forth. If he would have got two years to study, probably Shubhash Bose would have stood first in the ICS exam. Next. No, I don't. Shubhash was debating. His conscience did not permit him to join the ICS exam, to join the ICS career. Because he realized he cannot serve two masters. He wanted to fight for India's freedom. At the same time, he cannot serve the British Empire. He decided to resign from the ICS. My great-grandfather, his father, Janaki Nath Bose, was not at all happy. He wanted him to have a comfortable career in life. If he would have joined the ICS, he would have had a very comfortable life. But no, the call of the nation demanded something else from Shubhash. He decided to resign from the ICS, in spite of his father not being very happy about it. But there was one person who supported Shubhash Bose's decision. That was my grandfather, Sarat Chandra Bose, Subhash's elder brother, who stood next to his younger brother, Subhash, throughout his life. You see, a lot of people in the family state that there would not have been any Subhash if there would have been no Sarat Bose. Sarat Bose stood like a rock of Gibraltar next to his brother throughout his career as a politician, as a freedom fighter, and then as a supreme commander of the Azad in Forge. So he decided to quit and he wanted to come back to India and plunge into the freedom movement. You see, in those days, everybody who wanted to fight for freedom joined the Congress platform. You see, the Congress in those days was not a political party. It was a platform to fight for India's freedom. So he joined Gandhiji's non-cooperation movement and he came and met Mahatma Gandhi. And Gandhiji advised him to work under another great national icon, Deshbandhu Chittaranjan Das. You see, Shubhash Chandra Bose had two gurus. His spiritual guru was Swami Vivekananda and his political guru was Desh Bandhu Chittaranjan Das. You see, Chittaranjan Das's ideology was Purna Swaraj. Shubhash Bose also supported Purna Swaraj. But there were differences in the Congress High Command about Bhubna Swaraj, complete independence. So Netaji made it very clear that India must attain complete independence. We are not interested in dominion status. We are not interested in partial freedom. So there started differences with Shubhash Chandra Bose and the Congress. You see, in 19, what Dr. Shapun Das Gupta has mentioned, that he was always very disciplined. And there was always 
militarism within Subhash Chandra Bose. So in 1928, when the Calcutta Congress was held, Subhash has had established a uniform volunteer corps. And this uniform volunteer corps every morning in the Calcutta Maidan, they used to have a parade. Now, I would try to relate an incident which I heard from my father, Amiyanath Bose, that Subhash Chandra Bose, dressed in his uniform, was coming down the stairs of our one Woodburn Park house. And his father, Janaki Nath Bose, my great-grandfather, was standing on the first floor. Now, while Subhash was coming down, Janaki Nath, made a statement. Janaki Nath had said, Shubhash, I hope you will be the Garibaldi of India. Shubhash Bose, the message that Janaki Nath Bose's father had given, Shubhash kept to his commitment. He became the Garibaldi of India. I think this was rather prophetic what Janaki Nath Bose had stated. Now, in 1938, Shubhash Chandra Bose was elected the Congress President. It was the Haripura Congress. He became the President. And do you know, the first planning committee of India, Shubhash Chandra Bose was not only the first head of state, he was not only a freedom fighter, a statesman, he was a planner, he was a visionary. He planned, if you read his books, there are two books which is a must read. You must read these two books, The Indian Pilgrim and The Indian Struggle. There Shubhash Bose has clearly stated that after independence, what should be India's planning for the next hundred years? So he had formed the first planning committee of India in 1938. And as he was so inclusive, in spite of differences, he made Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru the chairman of the planning committee, the first planning committee of India. But differences started to arise. The second term, when he again contested the presidential election in 1939, which was the Tripuri Congress, you see, Shubhash Bose had great respect and admiration for Mahatma Gandhi. It was Shubhash Chandra Bose from Southeast Asia who had called Mahatma Gandhi as father of the nation. He had stated over the Azad Hind radio that the father of the nation, I request you to lead the nation to victory. So today we all call Mahatma Gandhi the father of the nation, but many of us may not really know that it was Shubhash Bose who gave him that respect by calling him the father of the nation from the frontiers of the war in Southeast Asia. But it was very unfortunate that the 1939 presidential Congress elections, Mahatma Gandhi had put up another candidate against Shubhash Chandra Bose. Pattabhi Sitarabhaiya. Everyone in the Congress knew that it would be Pattabhi Sitarabhaiya's victory. After all, he was Mahatma Gandhi's candidate. How could you defeat Pattabhi Sitarabhaiya? The elections were held. When the results were declared, people were very surprised and shocked. Shubhash Chandra Bose was victorious in 1939. Congress presidential elections by defeating Gandhiji's candidate Pattabhi Siddharamaya. It is more unfortunate that Mahatma Gandhi had made a statement that Pattabhi Siddharamaya's defeat is my defeat. This was not expected from the Mahatma. However, this is history, it cannot be changed. These facts of history must be presented to today's youth. And that is the objective that we are working with. The other issue that I would like to raise, 
the president, the 1939 Congress president, although that time it was not really a political party, it was a platform for to fight for India's freedom, but the last elected Congress president was Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose in 1939. After that, the president of the Congress is selected from within a dynasty. There were some cases where others were selected, but in most cases, if you see after 1939, a proper election was never held to elect the president of the Congress. Thereby, signaling that democratic values were completely destroyed in the Congress party after 1939. But I would also like to state that Shubhash Chandra Bose did not resign from the Congress presidentship because of differences with Mahatma Gandhi, Pandit Nehru and others. He resigned from the Congress because he realized that the Congress leadership will not be able to achieve Purna Swaraj or freedom for our nation. He realized the limitations of the non-violent movement. He realized that the might of the British Empire cannot be shaken by a non-violent struggle. He realized an armed struggle is essential to drive out the British from India. And that is the reason he resigned from the president's post. He never resigned from the party. He was expelled from the party later on. That history should also be corrected. Many people are under the impression that he resigned from the party. He did not. He only resigned as president of the Congress party. But even as primary membership, he was expelled from it. He formed the forward bloc first within the Congress platform and then he made it a political platform. This was in July 1939. Now the Shubhash Bose was under captivity, as you know, in his Elgin Road house in Calcutta. There he planned the heroic journey that he undertook. And it was on the 17th of January, 1941, a very historic day that Shubhash Bose escaped. The entire house was under British police surveillance. British intelligence officers were always there, 24 hours, round the clock. But he escaped. He travelled as a Pathan through India. He went from Kolkata to Gomo, from Gomo to Peshawar, Peshawar to Kabul, Kabul to Moscow and Moscow to Berlin. Very few leaders of that era in India could have ever even thought of undertaking this journey. But Shubhash Bose planned and implemented his plan. You see, I saw Shubhash Bose always as a man of action. There are many leaders, erstwhile leaders, even current day leaders, who give speeches, who say a lot of good things, but what percentage of the statements they make actually is implemented in reality. Shubhash Bose always practiced what he preached. He always implemented what he actually planned. And this was the plan that he had implemented. He went to Berlin. There is a controversy that he should have never gone to Germany to meet Adolf Hitler. Probably Shubhash Bose hated Adolf Hitler. But as Dr. Trapundas Gupta has stated, my enemy is enemy has to be my friend in order to liberate my nation. So he took this chance, he went to Berlin. He had to wait for a considerable period to get an appointment with Adolf Hitler. But he finally got the appointment. He met Hitler. 
During the discussions, Shubhash Bose had stated, you have read, many of you have read Mein Kampf, Hitler's biography. There he has written insulting words, a lot of derogatory statements are made in his book about Indians. Shubhash Bose was the only Indian who could challenge Adolf Hitler and he stated that Herr Hitler, you are not aware of India's rich heritage and culture. You are completely ignorant about India. You have no right to write rubbish in your book, Mein Kampf. You better first understand the Indian civilization. You first appreciate Mohenjo-daro, Nalanda universities. You first understand the concept of India before you can comment and write in your book, Mein Kampf. You please delete these barriers. Hitler needed one bullet to eliminate him, but Hitler did not. He, he realized here was a man who was a nationalist. Here was a man who was a patriot. Here was a man who, have, who has crossed the high seas to fight for his country's freedom. That is why Hitler did not eliminate him. Hitler arranged a submarine so that Shubhash Bose could go all the way to Japan and Southeast Asia to continue the fight for India's freedom. So a lot of people say that Hitler did not help him. If Hitler did not arrange the submarine, Shubhash Bose could have never reached Southeast Asia during the Second World War. These are things which uh, there is a time factor, so I would quickly go through. I think many of you are aware of this history, that Shubhash Bose had launched the Indian flag with the springing tiger at the center. Later on it was replaced by the Ashok Chakra. Janaganaman was actually born in Germany, in Hamburg, in 1942. You see, it was Subhash Chandra Bose who had approved Janagana Mana as the national anthem of India. This history is again not known. We have documentation that he heard the Hamburg Philharmonic Orchestra had played Janagana Mana in Hamburg. And Subhash Bose was present there. And he gave his consent that this should be the national anthem of free India. Now in 1943, on the 8th of February, the submarine arranged by Adolf Hitler, Shubhash Bose got into this submarine. It was not a pleasure trip. It was a trip for 90 days. No man on earth, apart from Shubhash Chandra Bose, has ever undertaken a 90-day submarine journey to cross the high seas, to cross continents, and come from Germany to Southeast Asia. So this is another fact of history which has to be documented and presented to the nation. On 21st of October, Shubhash Bose establishes the first free government of United India. 15th of August 1947, was a divided dominion established. It was not a free government of India. This history must be told. The first free united government of India, Akhan Bharat Ke Azad Sargar, was established on 21st of October 1943 and Shubhash Chandra Bose was the first Prime Minister. On the 15th of August 1947, Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru was the Prime Minister of a divided dominion of India. This is again a fact of history. 
22nd March 1944. These are essential dates that I am mentioning to you. The Indian National Army, the Azad in Fauj, with the marching tune, Kadam Kadam Badaye Ja, Kushi Ka Geet Gaye Ja, Is Zindagi Hai Kaum Ki, A Kaum Pe Lutaye Ja. With this marching tune, I am happy to state that today in the Indian Army, they play this tune while marching. One good thing at least we have learned from the Azad in Fauj. So with this marching tune, the Azad in Fauj marched towards the Infar border. They entered Nagaland. They captured Moiran. Moiran was captured by the provisional government of Azad Hind and the Azad in Fauj on the 14th of April. When was, I would like to ask a question to the audience, very enlightened audience at JNU. When was the first time that the Indian tricolor was hoisted on Indian soil? Any of you? From the audience. Uh, well, it's there, but I wanted the answer from you. 14th of April 1944 was the Independence Day of India. 15th of August 1947 was Dominion status of India. For three months, the Azad Hind government was in charge of Moiran. They had driven out the British from Moiran. Half of Nagaland was with the Azad Hind government. Where is this history? That was the first free government. Freedom for even one day is freedom. So for three months, the Azad in Forge was there and Colonel Shaikat Ali Malik hoisted the Indian tricolor at Moiran. At that time, Netaji's plan was Azad in Forge would march towards Delhi, Red Fort. It would have happened. Why didn't it happen? It is very unfortunate uh, but I have to mention, because I cannot distort history. I, my conscience will not allow me to distort history. At that time, the Congress leadership, sitting at Delhi, opposed the Azad in Forge and the provisional government of Azad in. If that time the Congress leadership would have supported the first free government of India, the Azad in Forge, Kadam Kadam Badhae Ja, with this tune would have marched right up to Delhi and would have hoisted the tricolor at the Red Fort here. And India, the freedom, Akhan Bharat ke India would have been maintained from 1944 onwards. We need not have divided the nation. How, what did it help? We have created a jihadi state. We have created Kashmir. We have created Bangladesh, which was East Pakistan earlier. We have cross-border terrorism. It should have been an integrated nation. We would have handled the terrorists ourselves. But we lost the opportunity of remaining united to tackle issues unitedly. But one man, if Shubhash Chandra Bose would have returned to India, India, he would have maintained the first free government which was the United Government of India. That would have been maintained even till today in 2018. We lost that opportunity. But the Azad in Forge could not reach Delhi. But three officers of the Azad in Forge did. In 1946, you are aware, the INA trials which were held, and there were three officers. One Muslim, Shadwaz Khan. One Sikh, Gurbak Singh Hilong and the third, a Hindu, Prem Kumar Sai. They were tried for high treason. That was a trial which shook the very foundations of the British Empire in India. These are not my words. These are words of Lord Clement Attlee. These are words of Lord Mountbatten. These are words of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. These are today's words of our National Security Advisor, Sri Ajit Tovalji. 
these are words of any true Indian who wants to know the true history of India's freedom struggle. So today, the responsibility that we have, right from 1857 onwards, from the Sipoy uprising, the Mangal Pandey's revolution, right up to 1947, Bhagat Singh's contribution, sacrifice, Rajguru's sacrifice, Khudiram Bose's sacrifice, Biroy Badal Dinesh's sacrifice, thousands of revolutionaries who gave up their lives by going to the gallows. We are not having it in the textbooks of history, even in 2018. It is a shame that we Indians have not been able to pay homage to people who did not hesitate to sacrifice their lives. Today we breathe in free India because of these people, these icons who did not hesitate to do everything for India's freedom. We must do this. So this is what happened when the INA trials were held. Bhulawai Desai was the council, main defense council. What he had stated that it is not high treason. What is the international law? Shubhash Chandra Bose did what George Washington did. George Washington is appreciated by the British, by Great Britain. It is the same that Netaji did. A provisional government of Azad Hind, which was accepted by 11 nations across the world. All the Axis powers, Ireland, Soviet Russia, accepted, acknowledged the provisional government of Azad Hind. So a government was waging war against Britain to capture land, to capture land to fight for an enslaved nation, which was India. So under the British, under the international law, it is not treason. They were heroes. And that's exactly what happened. Bulawai Desai's argument completely crushed the, the uh, case against the three war criminals. And they were freed as heroes of the nation. The moment the news spread about the heroic battle of the Azadin Forge, about the trials, iron and trials in the Red Fort, there was a naval mutiny. The Royal Indian Navy in Bombay Port, today Mumbai Port, there were 88 ships. 78 of the ships revolted against the British Empire. The Union Jack was brought down and the Indian tricolor, Indian national flag was hoisted. This has happened. Then in the British Air Force, then in the British Army, they started fasting. They would refuse to eat. That time Britain realized that their game was up. What actually made Britain leave India? It was the loyalty and allegiance of the British armed forces were completely destroyed. Britain ruled India with, British, with Indians. Only the generals and the senior officers were British, but all other soldiers and officers were Indians. They realized that we are fighting against our own brothers and sisters in the Azadin Forge. This cannot happen. So they revolted and mutinied. So I would like to quote from Michael Edwards, a British historian, who has given a very apt quotation. This is, it slowly dawned. Next. It slowly dawned upon the government of India that the backbone of British rule, the Indian army, might now no longer be trustworthy. The ghost of Shubhash Bose, like Hamlet's father, walked the battlements of Red Fort and this suddenly amplified figure overawed the conferences that were lead to independence. In a nutshell, Michael Edwards 
has given a very apt description how India attained its independence. The other issue that I would like to state, that on the 15th of August 1947, when this dominion, two dominions were born, Pakistan and India, do you know the Indian national flag was hoisted on the 15th of August, midnight, but the Union Jack kept also flying. The Union Jack was not brought down. What kind of independence is this? In Pakistan, the Union Jack was brought down when they attained freedom. But Lord Mountbatten had advised the then Prime Minister of the Dominion that don't dare to bring down the Union Jack. The Union Jack was brought down when the naval mutiny took place. The ships had brought down the Union Jack and the Indian flag was flown. That was true independence. How can you keep flying? The people who have ruled us, who have tortured us for 200 years, their flag kept flying. With that, why should you fly the Indian flag? This is another fact of history which must be documented and told to the nation. Okay, now I will briefly deal about Subhash Bose's relevance in 21st century India. You see, Subhash Bose, as I have already stated, he was greatly inspired by Ramakrishna Paramahansa. Swami Vivekananda was his political guru, uh, sorry, spiritual guru, and Aurobindo Ghosh. He was also a voracious reader. He has read other world icons, maybe coming from different ideology and thoughts. Nevertheless, to become a world icon, which Subhash Chandra Bose was, he was known as the hero of Asia by none other than Momuru Shige Mitsu. Who was Momuru Shige Mitsu? Momuru Shige Mitsu was the foreign minister of Japan during the Second World War and even afterwards. My father, Omiyonath Bose, had the opportunity to meet Momuru Shige Mitsu in 1956. He was then also the foreign minister of Japan, a very important man in Japan. When my father entered his chamber in Tokyo, Momuru Shige Mitsu stood up. He was a very senior elderly person a senior minister of the Japanese cabinet. My father was a young man. He stood up and he stated that I am really honored to meet the nephew of the hero of Asia, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose. This kind of respect Subhash Chandra Bose brought across the globe, across Southeast Asia. He was not only a liberator of India, he was an inspiration a liberator for all nations who stood and wanted to fight for the freedom of their nation. So he, I have a mentioned Garibaldi. He was deeply inspired by Garibaldi. Then the impact of the American War of Independence, the Italian struggle for liberation and unification, all these movements and struggles had inspired Subhash Chandra Bose to fight for his, for his motherland. There is a very nice book which has been released recently by Professor Proshanjit K. Basu. He's a professor at Singapore, based in Singapore. If you have the opportunity, I would request Professor Tiwari to invite him to speak on some occasion at JNU. He has done extensive research on Southeast Asia. So here he has said, Asia reborn, a continent rises from the ravages of colonialism and war to a new dynamism. You see, he feels that Netani Subhash Chandra Bose, if he would have continued as the first Prime Minister of India, we would have followed the Japanese model. Today, if you see the nations in Southeast Asia, if you see Malaysia, if you see Malaysia, if you see Korea, if you see Singapore, they have not followed the Western pattern. 
they all followed the business and trade model of Japan and they have been very successful. I think India, we got it all wrong when we started off in 1947. However, that is another chapter and another discussion. I would not like to go into details. But I think we need to understand the comparison. Today, George Washington is a hero, even in India. But when we talk about Subhash Chandra Bose, who actually liberated us, you see, I would like to add something here. It is not only because of Subhash Bose that India attained freedom. The movement of Mangal Pandey, the non-violent struggle of Mahatma Gandhi all played a role. Congress was a party of the elite. Gandhiji converted it into a mass movement. Certainly Gandhiji's contribution has to be appreciated. But that did not bring us freedom. That brought us awareness that we must achieve freedom. We cannot remain an enslaved nation forever. Gandhiji did that. But the final onslaught on British imperialism was none other than the Battle of the Azad in Forge and the subsequent INA trials held at the Red Fort. This is also a fact of history to be noted. Now Washington, leading military and political role next, in the American Revolution, Netaji Comparison between George Washington and Subhash Chandra Bose, leading military and political rule in the Indian independence movement, he organized the Indian National Army, he set up the provisional government, the first free government of United India, took political stand against the acts of British Parliament in 1767, George Washington, commanded the Continental Army in the American Revolutionary War. Both are world icons. But why, when we talk about Subhash Bose, we talk with a whisper, but we talk aloud about George Washington. I think both men were equally great. Both men fought to free their nation. Both men tried to unite their nation. Main concerns and objective of Shubhash Bose, which we should understand and maybe imbibe. To liberate India from British rule, exploitation and oppression, reconstruction of free India. We are still in that process. You see, Shubhash Bose, as you are aware, formed the first planning committee of India in 1938 which he set the trend for economic planning, social reconstruction of independent India. Now, Subhash Bose, he wanted three kinds of freedom. Just political freedom is not sufficient for any nation. Subhash Bose fought for political, social and economic freedom. So the relevance of Subhash Bose, we have obtained political freedom. But have we achieved what Subhash Bose meant by social and economic freedom? Emancipation of women, right to education for all, both men and women. We are a far cry away from achieving Subhash Chandra Bose's ideal and principles. In 1943, Shobhash Bose established the Rani of Jhansi Regiment. No other army in the world in 43, in the 40s, had ever thought of having a women's regiment to fight for freedom. Shobhash Bose established it. That was giving real honor and empowerment to the women, which we have not been able to achieve even after over 70 years we have been an independent nation. Rani of Jhansi Regiment soldiers, Captain Lakshmi Saigal, who was the commander of the Rani of Jhansi Regiment, they were empowered to fight along with the men 
for India's freedom struggle. Shubhash Bose once, when the Indian National Army was retreating towards Burma, the Azadi Forge lost the war. It's a fact. Azadi Forge did not lose the war. The correct interpretation is, a lot of people say Azadi Forge lost the war. No, that's not correct. Azadi Forge lost the battle because they had to retreat. They never surrendered. The Japanese surrendered. Azadi Forge never surrendered. But they did have to retreat. They had to leave Moida. But Azadi Forge lost the battle but won the war. They won the war because it was the impact of the Azadi Forge and the IMA trials which finally gave India freedom. Today, we need to take this example. I was telling you a story about how Shubhash Bose, while retreating, he was walking with the Rani of Jhansi regiment officers. Many of them were injured. You see, it was a very hilly terrain. It's a rough terrain, the Burma border. Shubhash Bose was walking with them. Rani of Jhansi regiment commander, Lakshmi Saigal, told Nital that, sir, please get into your jeep and go away. Why do you walk with us? Here was the warrior, Rana Pratap in action. Netaji Shubhash Chandra Bose, his warrior instincts, he had imbibed from none other than Maharana Pratap. He told Lakshmi Saigal, no, I will not. I will walk with you because I have to lead, lead you from the front. Shubhash Chandra Bose, it is documented in the INA history, walked for 100 kilometers along with the injured soldiers of the Rani of Chansi Regiment. <laughs> Today, Indian Army, they are heroic. They are fighting across the border. They are protecting us. But I would like to send this message to the Indian Army officers. They are very bold. But have they heard that the Supreme Commander of the Azad Infa Forge, the first Liberation Army of India, walked along with the Rani of Jhansi Regiment officers for over 100 kilometers after the war? Now, economic planning. Shubhash Bose wanted industrialization and trade to prosper. If you read his books, the two books that I have quoted, both the Indian struggle and the Indian building, you will find this thoughts of economic planning. He wanted innovation and knowledge. He wanted each person to be educated. At least the right to education up to secondary education must be there. He was a very spiritual person. In fact, Subhash Bose, always had the Bhagavad Gita in his pocket at the war front. Many of you are not aware. When things were not going all right, he used to sit down and meditate for hours at the war front. And he used to always carry the Bhagavad Gita. So he was a spiritual person, a nationalist. He was very inclusive. The secular word, unfortunately, has been misused by many. So I don't want to use that word. Inclusive is the word. He was inclusive. He wanted equal rights for all communities, which could be the uniform civil code in today's context. So this was a man that today's youth must follow to the letter. Spirituality, nationalistic, inclusive, and the social democrat. That is the plan and that is the ideology we must follow in today's India. His attitude towards religion, he was a staunch Hindu. He used to, he used to be a Kali Bhakt. He used to pray at the Kali Mandir in Dakineshwar and also in Kali Bhakt in Kolkata. But he had respect for all religions. In fact, I would like to tell you an incident in Singapore when 
the temple, there was a temple, the high priest of a temple had invited Subhash Chandra Bose to come to the temple to take a donation. The temple authorities wanted to give a donation to the Azad in government so that they can fight for India's freedom. But the high priest conveyed to Subhash Chandra Bose that you 